gracious, eternal God, our Father, we come right now with a praise on our lips. We come with a shout in our hearts. We come dancing in our feet. And we put clapping in our hands. Because you are God. And you are God alone. And above you, there is no other. We love you. And we thank you for loving us. In spite of our sins. In spite of our shortcomings. In spite of our downfalls and our pitfalls, we can come to you because your grace and your mercy, they're brand new each and every day. We thank you for being a loving God, a forgiving God, a caring God. We say Abba, Father, because it is our childlike expression that we surrender now to you. For it is all to you that we owe. We give you our praise. We give you our corporate worship. We love you, Lord. And we thank you for loving us. No greater love than the love you have for us. We thank you. We love you. We praise you, Lord. And now these, your people, have come to hear a word. I pray now, Lord God, that I will surrender myself, my flesh, my body, my soul, my spirit unto you. Fill me afresh now with your Holy Spirit. Lord, I need you. Can't do it without you. Thank you for the promise that you gave me that you never left me. You never left us. You left us a comforter, an advocate who is standing beside us right now. Holy Spirit, we need you. Speak to these, your people. Have your will, have your way in this place, O oh Lord. Now let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, our strength and our redeemer, we ask this in the mighty, the matchless name of our once crucified but now risen Savior, Jesus the Christ, we pray, and the saints of God say amen. Amen, amen. I know you've been standing for a minute, but bear with me as uh, you continue to stand. Get your Bibles, your phone apps your smart devices, whatever means or mode you have your word on, I need you to turn to 1 John, not John, 1 John. It's in the back of your Bible. 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, th th that section. Jude, Revelation, back of your Bible. 1 John, we're going to read the first chapter in its entirety. 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 10. You read it in the translation that you have. I will be reading it from the New King James Version. The New King James Version. When you have it, say amen. 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 This is God's recorded word. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. Underline, highlight, underline, highlight that word of life. The life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you, that you also may have fellowship, underline, highlight that word, fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship, second time, highlight, underline, 
is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you that your joy, not your happiness, but your joy may be full. This is a message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light. Underline, highlight that. And in him is no darkness at all. There it is again, that absolute. If we say that we have fellowship, third time, highlight, underline, with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Tell your neighbor, that ain't me, that ain't me. <laughs> but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship, fourth time, with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. That absolute again, not some, all. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. That's what saying, you're a liar. And the truth is not in us. Here's some good news. If we confess our sins, he is what? And just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from what? There it is again, an absolute unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar. Not you, but him, a liar. And his word is not in us. This is the recorded word of God. You may be seated in his presence, but do this for me. On your way to your seat, tell your neighbor, what a fellowship. What a fellowship. And that, that's, that's what we're talking about today. What a fellowship. The author of this text is one by the name of John. John the Apostle who was also the gospel writer, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. John was one of Jesus's apostles. As a matter of fact, he became a follower of Jesus when he was a teenager. And by the time he pens this text, he is in his 80s. I want you to catch it. He was... 18, 20-ish is what theologians say. But by the time he pens this text, he's in his 80s. And he pens this text as the senior pastor emeritus. Let me, let me unpack that for you. So in other words, he was the pastor. He established churches, an apostle, and he has spread the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ and those that he has mentored, they carry on his mission, which was spreading the gospel. They are now the church. Somebody say, that's us. Now, what has happened is now John is writing this letter or this epistle to the church. Why is he writing the letter to the church? I'm glad you asked that question. Do you realize that during the first century AD, churches were being established? By the time he writes this epistle, there was this group called the Gnostics. Say that with me, Gnostics. This was a false doctrine. The Gnostics their philosophy or their teachings basically said that Jesus was not the Christ. He was not God. In other words, the deity of Christ as the incarnated son of God was not true. And that salvation as they knew it, 
the Gnostics, they practiced Gnosis, which basically meant that it was salvation was through knowledge. It was through knowledge. I don't know about you, but, you know, I, I wasn't a theologian. I didn't go to seminary. I don't have letters behind my name. So I don't fall in the category of the Gnostic. I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer. I, I graduated from Northeast Louisiana University with a BA in criminal justice. But the word of God, the word of God lets me know that your knowledge, worldly knowledge, does not replace revelation knowledge. See, they, they're talking knowledge from the flesh, but God is a spirit. And the word says, those that worship me, worship me in spirit and in truth. There it is, truth. So they were falsifying their doctrines, basically saying, if you don't have what I have, then you can't be saved. This was problematic, so problematic that by the second century and the third century, Gnosticism was now considered a gospel. Do you know what the word gospel means? Good news. So imagine you having this doctrine being taught at RCF. Only those that had the knowledge were the ones that could have salvation. John writes the letter to refute this lie. Somebody say, that's a lie. That's what's happening today. False doctrines are taking place all over this country. If you're teaching something other than the birth, the death, the resurrection, the ascension, and the return of Christ, that's a false doctrine. Yeah. So you need to know that as a member of RCF, you don't have a false doctrine. Take some time to, to read what the doctrine is at this church. We believe in water baptism, the submersion of the body. We believe in celebrating the Lord's Supper with the elements that represent his, the bread represents the broken body and the wine which represents his shed blood. Those are two of your fun, foundational doctrines that we believe in. Somebody say, that's the word. So John is writing to the churches that he established now, you will see in verses 1 through 4, he's not just talking about what he heard. I know faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But John is writing to some people that heard some lies. And he has to set the story or the record straight. And so he reminds them in verse 1 that, which was from the beginning, which we have heard. That's reverence to Genesis 1 and 1. In the beginning was the heavens and the earth. That's God. Then as a gospel writer, he comes back. That was Genesis 1 and 1. John, Pastor Karen, comes back in John 1 and 1 and, and says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. He is an eyewitness to the beginning. How do I know that? I know that because John was the brother of James, the son of Zebedee. They were known as the sons of thunder. Uh, the Greek word there is boanerges. Boanerges. They were the sons of thunder. In other words, the brother had fire. If you came in and you said something out against God, he was that armor bearer that was going to, you, you know, he, he was going to do some things to you. He was going to set you straight. That, 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 that was this John. This was the same John that bore witness because, remember, 
Peter, James, and John, they were the beloved of Jesus. They went up to the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus. They were part of his three-year earthly ministry. So John is letting us know, I'm not telling you something I heard. I know. He was an eyewitness to the deity of Jesus the Christ. That's verses 1 and 2. Now he comes back and he says, in the, in the uh, B part of verse 1, he was the word of life. The word of life. In other words, he was the spoken word that became life. Again, that's John 1 and 1. He was the spoken word that became life. Anything God said, he spoke it into existence. His word is the truth. He lays out some, some reasons that he wrote this epistle. If you're taking notes, I'm going to give you four. Four reasons that he wrote this epistle. The first one, and I, I, I love John's, uh, I love his style, because I don't know about you. When I read, I get distracted. My mind goes to the left and to the right, and then I make my way back. Sometimes, you know, you start reading the word. It's, it's like Thanksgiving Day after you've eaten that turkey. <laughs> Your eyes get heavy, right? But I, I like the way that John does it. John brings it back full circle in all five uh, chapters in, in the first epistle. So here are the four reasons he writes the letters. I'm taking notes. The first one is found in John 1, 1 John 1, verse 4. He says, in these things we write to you that your joy may be full. That's the first reason he writes it. That your joy may be full. I told you earlier that uh, joy is not something where it's internal that you got to make me feel good for me to have joy. See, that, that's, that's happening. Something has to happen in order for me to feel happy. But joy is internal. The joy that I have, the world didn't give it, and the world can't take it away. That is the relationship you have with Jesus the Christ, his joy. The second reason he writes is to warn us about habitual sin to warn us about habitual sin. That is chapter 2, verse 1. So what is habitual sin? You give your life to Christ, you're saved, you're sanctified, you're filled with the Holy Spirit. But because you're saved and you're sanctified and filled with the Holy Spirit, guess what? At the end of the day, you're still flesh and blood. Uh, anybody in here can relate? You flesh and blood? Paul, Paul says, even when I try to do right, I do wrong. Um, before you were saved, that person that was in the world, that person will rise up. Come on, somebody. We in church now. Shame the devil. That person will rise up. All right, I'm going to get in your business just a little bit. Just a little bit. Fellas, that fine sister. You saved, you sanctified, you got a wife. You walking down the sidewalk, little skin showing, and you got them roving eyes. That's that flesh. Oh, women, you thought I was going to leave you out? That, that same brother? This got the muscle shirt on, got the six pack, got the pecs, clean cut. I hear you, sister. That's your man. Uh huh. See, I, I love it when I got one real sister in the house. Y'all were amen and shouting when I was talking about the brothers, but then when I started talking about you, <clears throat> yeah, we all have. 
flesh issues. Uh, the scripture says it's the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That, that's what he's addressing here. So he's warning us about habitual sins. Uh, Romans says it's like this. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But what he's referring to, habitual sins, means that now that you're a Christian, we're saved. It's not saying that you don't sin. You just sin less. You saw that play on words, sinless. You just sin less. Habitual sin means that you, you haven't given your life to Christ and you, and you love the sin that you're in. You, you're not trying to stop drinking. You're not trying to stop smoking. You're not uh, trying to stop fornicating. You're not, tr you're not trying to stop lusting. Why? Because you don't have a sin nature or a sin conscience. But when you give your life to Christ, the spirit, the new mind, the new heart comes in, and now you have a sin conscience. Old saints used to say it like this. The places I used to go, y'all had the same old saints that, that the things I used to do, I, why? Because you have a sin conscience. You have a moral compass to say that now I am living according to the word of God and not according to the world. Living according to the word and not the world. The world says, don't, don't, don't throw darts at me, water balloons. The world says that it's okay to have a same-sex marriage. Oops, did he say that from the pulpit? God said that from the word. I'm just repeating what the word says. That marriage is between a man, one man, and one woman. That's the word. The world says it's okay. Have same-sex marriage. That's the world. Now that you are part of God's family, we don't go by the moral compass of the world. We go by the moral compass of the word. That's, that's number two. Second reason he wrote. Third, we're moving. Third reason he wrote was to refute false teachers. To refute false teachers. These were these Gnostics, these false teachers. That's found in chapter 2, verse 26. To refute false teachers. The word tells us that in the latter days, there will be false teachers. There will be false doctrines. There will be itching ears that's going to these churches because they don't, the pastor or the pastors, you know, is co-pastors now, right? Um, they're writing a doctrine that fits their lifestyle. That's those itching ears. They, they, they're church hopping. Sunday morning, when you're getting this word, this, the real word, like this morning, Paul says it's like a two-edged sword. It's cutting you going in and coming out. They don't want the word. They don't want the truth. Itching ears want you to tell them it's okay to sin. The one thing that separates us from God is sin these false teachers. The fourth and final reason that he writes is to assure us of our salvation. He closes in chapter 5 with that, to assure us of our salvation. He's talking about what does it mean to be saved. We all were sinners saved by grace. We confessed. You know, confession is good for the soul. And I'll get to that as, as I close out. Confession and guilt, remember those two words? Um, and so those are the reasons he is writing this letter. Now, I, I had you to highlight and to underline the word fellowship. Um, you're about to be enrolled in the Greek 101 class. 
I'm not going deep. You're just going to get the reason it's called 101. I'm just going to give you one word <laughs> for today. That word fellowship in the Greek means konania. Say that, konania. That is your Greek word for today. Now, you can pass this class if you can say the word konania. Everybody got a hundred. So what does that word mean? Konania means fellowship. And he's talking about fellowship with the father and fellowship with the son. And then he's talking about fellowship with the apostles. So let me break that down to you. You have levels of fellowship. In this essence, you have horizontal fellowship. Horizontal fellowship is the apostles, their relationship, their partnership, their communion with Jesus Christ. Then you have vertical fellowship with God. Did you catch that? So the same thing that they're saying in this text, the same thing that John is saying in this text, the same holds true with us. We have horizontal fellowship, kononia, community, partnership. A part of this church, you have what we call community groups. Those community groups are basically smaller groups that come together in fellowship, Bible study, prayer, community, partnership. We have RCF. We have a global partnership, international ministries, missions abroad. Then we have the local community. If you were to take a look outside the window right now, we are doing what this text is talking about. How do I know that? Communal. You have safe parking. Community. Partnership. You have safe outdoor spaces, community, partnership. You have hot meals that are fed to our tenants on Tuesdays and Thursdays, community, partnership. On Wednesdays, we have community and partnership with partners, Salvation Army, Starbucks, we have a local church down the road, a church of God in Christ, Pastor McDonald. That is community, partnership. Somebody say that word again, konania. Now, this is the part I like. And, and the praise team, thank you so much because y'all brought it in today. Uh, then we have what I call corporate fellowship or corporate community or partnership. Taking notes, you want to get these three because this is what happens. Uh, matter of fact, uh, just remind your neighbor, I'm in the community. Yeah, I'm in the community. How do I know that? Because the day we exercise this text, here are the three elements of koinonia. What a fellowship. The first element of koinonia is participation. Ooh, I like that one. See, um, it holds you accountable. Participation. Who wants to sit on the sideline and, and watch from the peripheral? Uh, as athletes, you want to get in the game, right? You don't want to be on second screen, third team, because you don't get in the game unless something happens to the players that are above you. So when we have corporate community fellowship, you bring your praise to the party. I bring my praise to the party. I bring my shout to the party. I bring my prayer to the party. I bring my worship to the party. And before you know it, Everybody's participating in the praise. 
Say, on Sunday morning, I can't wait for Sunday morning. Why? Because I get to see all of your smiling faces. We come together in corporate worship where we can praise the name of Jesus together. Oh, come let us magnify him. Let us exalt his name together. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Let us magnify his name. With believers like faith. Participation. Next Sunday, tell your neighbor, I'm participating. I'm participating. I don't want to be on the bench. I'm participating. The second element of koinonia or fellowship is sharing. Sharing. What are we sharing? In the communal setting, you're bringing, my, my dad used to do it like this. This, this is an example. In a communal setting, I, um, and in, in the book of Acts, I think it's chapter 2, verse 42, somewhere in there, they gave us a picture of communal uh, where um, if Elder Corinne had um, some chicken and um, Elder Pat had some sweet potatoes and um, Elder Annette had some cabbage greens, um, we brought it all to the community and you showed up. <laughs> oh, Pastor Karen said, don't leave her out. She got the cornbread. Can't, can't have that meal without some cornbread. Yeah, old school, somebody got the Kool-Aid. Uh-huh. Red Kool-Aid, right? So community, everybody's bringing something to the community. If I got, you got. If you got, I got. We, we share, right? We, we share what we have. That's, that's koinonia. That's community. That's fellowship. Third one, third element of koinonia, of fellowship, is contribution. Contribution. What, what are you contributing? <laughs> what do you bring to the table, right? If your gift is praying, Sunday morning, I need you to be praying. If your gift is singing, the praise team needs you now. Uh, that, that, that is a recruitment. Anybody out there that can sing? They rehearse on Thursdays at 730 and on Saturdays at 10 o'clock. Rewind the commercial. Uh, if you can sing. They have rehearsals on Thursday at 7.30 and on Saturdays at 10 a.m. If you can pray, they pray every Monday at 11 o'clock. I'm sorry, 12 o'clock, 12 o'clock. If you can pray, you need to be in the sanctuary because we need intercessors. They pray on Saturday mornings at 9 a.m. They need you. If that is your gift, you contribute. If you got it going on, and when I say got it going on, you, you got the dough dollars, we need a roof. Go ahead and write that check. I know you got it in your account. About 400000 that's what it's going to cost to replace that roof. Go ahead, just write it. We know you got the money in the bank. You're rolling like that, do dollars. All right, young people, they got the stack. I, I don't want to leave you out. They got the stack, right? So what are you contributing? If God has blessed you with a tithe, he tells us to bring it to the storehouse. 10%, you're contributing. That's what's required of you. That's not the sacrifice. The sacrifice is the offering. That's in addition to your tithe. What are you contributing? What are you bringing to the table? I'm still in the text, you all. He says in verse 5, this is a message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light. And in him is no darkness of all. Jesus is the light of the world. If I were to tint these windows and turn off the lights, if Jesus was in here, 
he will still illuminate because he is the light. And guess what? We are an extension of Jesus Christ. And so the same light that shines on the inside of Jesus is the same light that shines with you. And when believers come together, light reflects off of light and darkness goes away. Do you know darkness and light, they can't dwell in the same place? Light is the dominant force. So we need to start shining our light. You need to be a beacon of light. You need to be the lighthouse that is shining, that is illuminating, that is drawing men and women, boys and girls to God. You need to be that house that's in your community that when they pass by, the anointing is so hot that when they pass by, if, they're, if they need healing, boom, the spirit hits them. That's the light of the Lord. When they are sick, you lay hands on them, the light of God that's on the inside of you. He just needs a human vessel so that when you lay hands upon them, that come do it, that light that's on the inside of you, lay hands and the sick will be healed. You are the light, the extension of Jesus the Christ. Uh, did you know Einstein said it like this, that light travels at the speed of sound. The speed of sound is 186,000 miles per second. Jesus sits in heaven, defies the laws of thermodynamics, the laws of gravity, travels at 186,000 miles per second, leaves the portal of heaven, comes into the portal of earth, takes on the flesh of a man, born of a virgin Mary, dies for the sins of this world, buried in a borrowed tomb. On the third day, rises up with all power of heaven and earth in his hands. Comes back in the form of a new body that you and I will get when we die. The word says to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. Gives you a new immortal body. Comes back preaches revival, Pentecost takes place, goes back up into heaven, seated at the right hand with his father, making intercessions for you. He is the light of the world. Come on, somebody. That's fellowship. He loves you so much that he left his pleasant place, sitting, sitting with his daddy, Abba, came down here, thought about you, thought about me, and gave his life so we could have life and to have life more abundantly. That's John 10 and 10. Fellowship. What a fellowship we have in Jesus. John said it like this. He bears witness of Jesus being the true light. See, we, we have all these different types of lights. Fluorescent lights. LED lights. You know, technology is always progressing. But Jesus is the true light. Man will never be that bright. He is the only true light. John said it like this. He said it seven times that he gives witness to Jesus. He says he is the bread of life. That's John 6, 35 and 48. He says in John 8 and 32, I am the light of the world. In John 10, 7 and 9, he says, I am the door. John 10, 11 and 14, he says, I am the good shepherd. John 14 and 6, he says, I am the way, the truth and the life. And then he closes it out with his last saying, I am the true vine. That's John 15 and and one. And so Jesus lays it out. He gives us these categories of who he is. God is life, three forms of life in scripture. Bios, which we get the word biology, suka, which is soul or spirit, and then Zoe, that is the fullness of life. God says that I am yo Zoe, the fullness of life. And if you connect with me, you can have the same joy, the fullness of life. See, you were drinking bitter water. The woman at the well, she went to the well. She drank from the fountain. 
And she said, I'll never thirst again. You've been drinking Hennessy, Ciroc, you, you know your drink, all of them drinks, bitter water. You satisfy for a minute because you got some liquid courage. Jesus says, you drink from this fountain, you'll never thirst again. Yeah. Relationship, fellowship, koinonia. Then he says, I am light. There is no darkness. There is no variance in him. He is true light. Last but not least, he says, I am love. See, in the English language, we only have one love. In the text or in the Bible, it lays out four different types of love. Would you like for me to share those with you? I'm almost done. The first one is sturge or sturge. That's family love. The second one is eros. That's erotic or sexual love. The third one is philios, which is brotherly love. But the one that Jesus has and the one that John talks about, it's agape. Unconditional love. In spite of who you are, in spite of the sins that we commit, in spite of us turning our backs on Jesus, in spite of us doing the things of the flesh when we give in, God says, in spite of all of that, I love you unconditionally. Your spouse walked out on you, turned their back on you. Your boo, your girlfriend, they walked out on you. Jesus says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. How do I know that? Because he said in this great commission that I'll leave you a comforter, an advocate, one that will be with you, one that will walk beside you, the one that will be the lawyer in the courtroom, the doctor in the hospital room. When you're sick and you're down and you don't have good news from the doctor, you've gotten the report that you have a terminal illness, God says, don't worry about it. I'm your doctor. He is your advocate. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. Verses 8 through 10, and I'll, pl I'll close out. Verses 8 through 10 is a depiction here of who we were before we were saved. Let me read it for your hearing, because this is good news. Might shout, might run, might dance. This is what he says in verses 9 and 10. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, this is hard, but it's fair. You don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. Because when we hear confession, that means that I'm being held accountable. Confession holds me and you accountable for what takes place. If I confess it, that's basically saying I did it. Problem with us, me included, is we don't want to confess that we did it. But I got good news for you. Confession is good for the soul. Because if you don't confess it, guess what? You got to live in it. You go to bed, living in it. You wake up, still living in it. It's the guilt that comes with sin that separates you from God. And I come to tell you this morning what a fellowship you have if you confess that you sin, that you're guilty, because the word says that he will wash you, cleanse you, make you whole again. That word means that you are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. What does that mean? In the Old Testament, when you sin, you have to have a blood sacrifice. So imagine every time you sin, got to kill something. Got to lay blood on the altar. We all know they ain't got that many animals in the world. <laughs> Hello, somebody. So Jesus says, Jesus says that my blood, my blood, you are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Do you know what that word means, redeem? Back in the day, they used to have these books, and the books, they had coupons, and, and you would get the coupon, you cut it out, and you put it in the book, and you turn the page, and when you fill up the book, you would go and redeem the book and got your prize. But Jesus says, I'm that coupon. 
I'm that book. I have given my life for you. I have given myself as a ransom for you. And because of the ransom that I have given for you, you can not only have life, you don't have to worry about sinning anymore, that you give your life. He gave his life so that you could have life eternally. No more need for blood sacrifices. His blood washes you clean. His blood makes you whole again. It was nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing but the blood. When we talk about the blood, we got some saints of old that were lynched from trees and their blood is crying out from the low fruit. Cain and Abel, his blood was, was crying out from the earth. But Jesus' blood washed us and made us whole again. He wants that fellowship with us, that koinonia, that community. Tell you this little story and I'm done. Uh, so uh, we all know that man's best friend is a dog. And uh, I have a dog. My dog, most of y'all know this story already, but for those of you that don't know it, I'll share it with you. I have any dog lovers in the congregation? Yeah, I got some friends. We got some friends. And so a dog is a man's best friend. And uh, my dog's name it's biblical. My dog's name is Phoebe. Phoebe. And so uh, Phoebe likes to have Conania. She likes to have fellowship with me. I'm her daddy. She cries out, Abba. Abba. I'm her daddy. When daddy comes in the room, she can hear me coming half a mile away. She goes to the door. And what I like about Phoebe, it doesn't matter how I treat her. She loves me for who she, for who I am. Uh, so Phoebe likes fellowship. She likes Konania. And so my wife and I, we went on vacation, and we were gone from Phoebe for two weeks. And uh, Phoebe was, uh, my sister Glenda, she kept Phoebe for us. Uh, I, I don't believe in putting her in the kennel. I, I like my dog to have some love. So I left her with my sister because I know my sister was going to love on her like I love on her because she loves pets too. And so when we got back, Phoebe was acting strange, looking at me like, who are you? Who are you? And, and, and so uh, Phoebe has, she has liberty. She's liberated. She has free reign like a horse out in a pasture. She can go in the living room, and she's got carpet she can lay on. She can go in the kitchen. She's got a, a, a floor rug or area rug she can lay on. She can go in the sitting room. She's got another rug she can lay on. She can go in the basement. She's got comforters, a king-size comforter. She's got a bed that she can lay on if she gets tired. So Phoebe, she's upset. So Phoebe decided, I'm going to show you that uh, you don't control me. So Phoebe decided that she didn't want to stay in the basement. And you know I got a smart dog. Uh, I came home, Phoebe had opened the door, she was looking at me like, Rrr. moved her car, moved her rug, she had moved her comforter, she was laying in the sitting area on the, uh, in the basement. She wanted fellowship with her daddy. And so I had to show Phoebe, just like Jesus does us, spare not the rod or spoil the child. So I put Phoebe in her kennel and said, you messed up my carpet, you're getting punished, so I put her in the kennel. Phoebe decided that she was an escape artist. She wanted to be Houdini. Phoebe decided to break out of her kennel, and guess what? A hard head makes a, uh-huh. Phoebe got stuck in the kennel, and she damaged her rear, uh, her, her uh, left and right side to where Miss Phoebe had to have surgery. So Miss, Miss Phoebe went through surgery, came out well. Thank you for your prayers. The point that I'm trying to tell you, Phoebe was like, I want to have fellowship with you. You my daddy, Abba, father. So guess what? Phoebe got promoted from the basement to the first floor. And now she's sitting at her master's feet. And the master is feeding her crumbs. Just like Jesus is sitting on the right hand of the Father, making intercessions 
for you and for me. And all I'm saying is the elders come and, and stand. And as you stand, all Jesus is saying in this text, you would please stand. This is our invitation. Invitation to a relationship. Invitation to be with the one and only person that can save you from yourself. Jesus the Christ wants to commune with you. He wants to have fellowship. He wants to have relationship with you. And you can do that by giving your life to Christ.